for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Good evening. How is everybody doing? It is Fade to Black. Today is Tuesday. That's right. Tuesday, August 29th, 2023. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. How's everybody doing? You know, I just got back from the UK and I got back last night. I'll talk more about that in just a second. But you can help support the show and all of our hard work by getting yourself a Fade to Black t-shirt. The links are below. There's two ways to get them. And there's two shirts that you can get. You can get the classic or you can get the new one penned. That's right, by Michael Oming, who is our guest tomorrow night on Fade to Black. We'll talk about a little bit about the T-shirt, but about what it's like, you know, being one of the greatest comic artists, comic book artists in the world. And we'll be doing all of that tomorrow night. And, of course, his deep research into not only UFOs and ETs and contact, but it, it, it it's about lost history with him and 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 megaliths and and religion, all of that is what he does. And we'll be doing that tomorrow night with Michael Oming. Uh, so get ready for that. Tonight, it's Michael Cremo, Forbidden Archaeology, and much more. We'll be doing that tonight. And human de-evolution. That's right. Not evolution. Tonight, de-evolution. We'll be covering all of that. Um, he's, you know, uh, Michael, uh, I, I, I can't remember the first time I, I sat down and, and chatted with Michael, but it was probably 10 years ago and he's been on with us a few times over the years and it's great to have him back. And he is known as the forbidden archeologist. And of course his bestseller landmark book, forbidden archeology, span which was first published in 1993. That's when I got my copy of the book. It has since then been translated into 26 languages. He got his uh, degree. Um, now, now check this out. He, he he got a scholarship to study international affairs at uh, George Washington University. But then after that, uh, he began to study ancient Sanskrit writings, and those are known as the Vedas. We'll be talking about that, too, as well. He is a member of the World Archaeological Congress and the European Association of Archaeologists. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only, and there he is right there, Michael Cremo. Michael Cremo in the house. Michael, young man, how you doing? I'm doing fine, Jimmy. I told you I'd get you to laugh. There's one. Yeah, that's one. I don't have very many of these things, so <laughs> use them sparingly. Yes. Well, uh, if, if I get two tonight, you're a landmark archaeologist. It'll be a landmark show. So let's see if I can get to number two. And uh, now, uh, can I say this, uh, Michael? Um, uh, it's very rare that I say something like this, but uh, you're one of my heroes, and you mean so much to this community and everything that you have done over the years. Um, I don't know how many times that you force the world and the community to just step back and go, whoa, right? You have done that. So just thank you for all of your tireless hard work, uh, not only uh, on behalf of myself, but on uh, behalf of the community and the world. Thank you, my brother. It's uh, you, You've done so much for us. So thank you. You're quite welcome. And yeah, I'm not in this alone. There are a lot of uh, researchers People who are interested in these things, supporting uh, supporting them. People providing platforms for communicating this knowledge. So, like you said, as a community, it it absolutely is. And um, you and I were just chatting before the show, 
And uh, and I mean this not in a cavalier way, everybody. Please uh, go with me on this. I literally just did a 14-hour flight yesterday, uh, and you can imagine what that's like, uh, uh, coming back from the U.K. Got back last night. Uh, dropped my bags, Michael. You've done this. You're on your way over to Europe yourself. You know what it's like after a whirlwind thing like that. I got back, I dropped my luggage in the bedroom, face first, face first in the bed. Woke up, you know, 12 hours later, uh, you know, my arms dead because I slept on them. <laughs> and and uh, But uh, I woke up this morning, was like, man, I feel great. And, uh, and here I am tonight. If I say something whack, okay, just, just go with it. Just, just know that I just, just uh, got done doing this. You're on your way. Uh, you're going to go over and speak in Europe yourself. You've got a couple of things. Where are you going to be speaking? Uh, in Zurich, Switzerland, at a, an event uh, on science, spirituality, and world peace. So I think the first thing is if there's going to be peace in the world, science and spirituality have to make peace among themselves. That's uh, okay. That is an amazing three segment topic for a conference. And, but you're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, the world, you know, and, 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 and oh, okay. Where are you speaking next? And then we're going to circle back to that. Uh, Budapest in Hungary, there's a conference there on Vedic cosmology that I'll be speaking at. And that's something I've uh, recently been focusing a lot on because I connected with a project in India uh, involving what's called the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium, which is meant to present to people the cosmology of ancient India, which I think has some relevance to things such as world peace and the environmental crisis and whatever. I'm heading over in, in a few weeks. I'm going back to Egypt. It seems like I just got back. It was last October I was there. And uh, I'm heading back uh, at the end of this month. And, and, you know, and I just got back from the UK too as well. And this is what um, this is why I wanted to swing back to, to this. When you look at, you get outside of the United States, right, where the oldest thing that we have here in Los Angeles is In-N-Out Burger, right? Okay, so, and that, that was supposed to be your second laugh right there was yeah. the, the, the second I was going to say, the, and the second oldest thing is me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> See, that was good. That was good. And, yeah. you know, and you get get outside of the United States and you swing around and you start observing things uh, that are just literally thousands of years old right there in, in public. Right. And, and in a lot of cases next to a brand new condominium or, or a bank. And then there's something crazy, crazy old in the middle where you have to stop and appreciate where the ancients, and it doesn't matter what the culture is, uh, India, China, Far East, Middle East, uh, North, South, Central America, uh, other examples, and of course across Europe, where those cultures, Michael, seem to have a grip, right? They had a grip on consciousness, right? They had a grip on your neighbors. They had, you know, they, they, they had an understanding of the stars and, and the mind. And for some reason, we just got amnesia, right? Where we have forgotten these things. Why do you, why do you think that is that we have to go back four or 5,000 years and look at the writings and the teachings of everybody um, and have to apply them to where we are today? Why do we forget? Shouldn't we have built on all of that? And, and, you know, today, 5,000 years later, shouldn't we be these advanced spiritual beings? What happened? Well, it, there could be many reasons for it. One of them is, I think, uh, the, one of the things that the ancients knew about was that there's a progression of ages. Time kind of goes in cycles. And, you know, we're familiar with the yearly cycle and temperate 
countries, you get a spring, a summer, a fall, a winter. And the ancients were aware of larger cycles of time in which there are different conditions. You know, say at different times of the year, we dress in different ways. In summer, we dress in a different way than we do in the winter time. So according to the Vedic cosmology, time goes in vast cycles called yugas. And the conditions are different. They're more favorable for the kind of knowledge that you're talking about in the first age, and then as each of the four ages progressively develops, things get a little bit worse for uh, that. And I think the beginning, there may be different opinions about these things. I'm aware of that. But since you're asking me my point of view, I'll give it. About 5,000 years ago, the Kali Yuga started, which is predicted to be an age of increasing environmental and social disturbance. And one of the things that happened is that the connections of the earth, of the civilizations on earth, which as you mentioned, were highly advanced. One feature of their advancement was their ability to be in contact with beings from other parts of the cosmos, extraterrestrials, you can call them. There are many names for them. And those connections were very helpful for civilization on the earth. But they began to break down about 5,000 years ago so that uh, the, the connections with those higher sources of wisdom and knowledge were gradually broken off. You know, if you go back to the writings of the ancient Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, you see they were regularly in touch with higher beings. Now, they may have called them gods or goddesses. Uh, I, I think there are different types of extraterrestrial beings. I have a kind of a, an expanded conception of what they are. I think they include things that were characterized as angels, gods, jinn, uh, depending on the culture, devas. They have, they have different names for them. Uh, the Norse gods, the gods that the Inca or the Aztec uh, spoke about. They all, all of these uh, ancient wisdom traditions and cultures seem to have some idea about these cosmic connections. So I think that's one thing that happened. We got cut off from uh, these higher sources of wisdom and knowledge of all types. And well, you know, and the question would be why. You know, and it's it's a broad question, but it is an important one because it didn't just happen in the Veda script, right? It didn't just happen with one specific culture. We saw this on uh, you know global, and it wasn't a transoceanic communication of a breakdown either as as well because it's in Sanskrit, right? It's in the hieroglyphs yeah. in in Egypt. Uh, the uh, that that. You know, why did it happen? Why? Why the cutoff? Well, it's uh, partially the uh, our misuse of our free will and independence. But the way I look at it is this cosmos, this universe that we exist in has a purpose. And that purpose is to enable the conscious selves who are here to qualify themselves to exist on a level of reality beyond the, the level of matter. Matter contact with matter limits consciousness. 
uh, for example, I'm a conscious individual self, which is ultimately eternal. But now I'm in a bodily vehicle made of matter. And it, it limits me. You know, it's temporary. It comes into existence at some point in time, and it goes out of existence at point in time. But that isn't the end of the conscious self. It may take another body made of matter, if that's reincarnation or transmigration of the soul. So some of the conscious selves, they take advantage of the human form of life, the human bodily vehicle, which can be used to elevate consciousness. I mean, there are different systems of esoteric systems of mysticism and yoga and contemplation that are meant to do that, elevate consciousness. But if we don't do that and we simply become engaged in competing with others to dominate, control, exploit the resources of matter, then we get a world like we see. And if enough people make those choices, well, then the sources of wisdom and knowledge from these other dimensions, they say, okay, have it your way. Right. Have, have fun. Now I'm making you laugh. <laughs> yeah, right. But, but it's so true. Hey, hey, Michael, uh, I'm just going to say this once. Can I get you to just tilt your laptop screen down just a skosh? Okay. Just a is skosh. That, okay. That yeah, better? that's perfect. Perfect. Okay. If it'll just and, no, it's, it's, and it's absolutely perfect. Uh, don't worry about it. And if we look at, and I, I want to talk about the Vedas specifically, but if we look at the ancient Sumerian texts, or uh, certainly uh, the the stories of uh, pre-dynastic Egypt that are uh, plainly uh, written, and you can read that, um, and, and including the Vedas, the the scripts may have a date of when they were written, but they all reference deep history, right? Deep, deep history with fantastical, and I, I say that word in the unbelievable sense, not the fan sense, like I'm a fan of the Denver Broncos, but a fantastical yeah. sense of what they were seeing and what they were witnessing. And if you're going back that far in deep history, and they're all talking about the same things in the general sense. What, how advanced were these cultures? And we're not even going back 100 million years. We're just talking about 10, 15, 20,000 years. That, I think that's evidence enough right there that there was something going on, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, the uh, Egyptian pharaoh lists go back about 100,000 years, according to John Anthony West and other others who've looked into it. The Babylonian or Sumerian king lists go back 432,000 years. Right, right. So, yeah, and the Chinese emperor list, you know, they go back very far in time. So you're, you're really right about that. And apparently from the descriptions left in the uh, ancient texts, they were quite advanced in the sense that uh, they were making use of technologies that go beyond what our science is now able to do with its focus on the grosser material elements. They were in touch with more subtle energies. They had a more subtle science. But... Uh, for example, the Vedic literatures, they speak about uh, vimanas, spacecraft, spaceships, flying, flying machines. They speak about weapons resembling 
modern nuclear weapons. They speak about cities that were very well planned and that were very comfortable to live in, not like our cities today, more like uh, what existed, say, in Europe a couple thousand years ago. So it's uh, it's really fascinating when you get into these things. Well, that, uh, and 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 I just cut off Michael Cremo. No, uh, I, I've, you I've, have I've, to do you have to do that, or <laughs> else I'll just keep talking and talking and talking. I'm not a I'm about to get a, a Vimana lightning bolt is going to strike my studio for that. I'm just, just, it's just going to come crashing down and I've learned my lesson. But, but when we look at the, the Vedic text and the mentions of uh, these Vimanas, they, they get very descriptive and, and the cities and, and as, where they're talking about levels, they're talking about engine rooms, they're talking about propulsion systems, they're talking about dining rooms. And on this level, we did this. And on the, the very, very descriptive, where that was supposed to be Stone Age man, right? The, 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 they, they didn't have an imagination like that. They, the only explanation, in my opinion, is that they were writing down exactly what was. This wasn't. Uh, a science fiction tale. Yeah, I I kind of go along with that. Yeah, you're you're really right about the descriptions of the Vimanas. Of course, there are different kinds, because according to the Vedas, we live in a multi-level cosmos. Yeah, there's one level of the cosmos dominated by the ordinary material elements, you know, iron, calcium, phosphorus, all of that. Uh, that's the level that we're on. But there are more subtle levels that are made up of different subtle energies and forces, vital forces, subtle energies, mental and intellectual energies. And there are beings that are adapted to that condition, and they live there, and they have their kinds of Vimanas. On our level, we've got 747s or 87s, I guess they are now, uh, flying metal machines. You know, we, we, we kind of have to dig into the earth and extract metal ores and refine them and put them together in factories. You know, and, and, uh, and these uh, texts, and here's, here's, okay. And here's the crazy part. And I'm, I'm, uh, we're going to talk about de-evolution here in a second. These texts talking about these very specific things were pre bronze age, right? At and, least. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Right. At least. And if we listen to the dogma, Right, <laughs> that is taught in in the universities today. If we take that literally, then they were writing about something that didn't exist uh, about fifteen hundred years, technically speaking, in a linear sense, uh, before the Bronze Age even existed. And that now, wait a minute, you can't have it both ways, can you? And that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, it's. Uh... Well, given their rules for how they want to play the game of science, they're doing okay. Yeah, but yeah, it's like science is like a game. You know, you, you play it by certain rules. And if one of your rules is you have you can't bring in any kind of higher intelligence, you can't bring in any non-material substance, like consciousness existing apart from matter, and you can't accept any, any knowledge that comes from any other source, then they're doing fine. Except, okay, except, this is where I bring in the big except. In Brian Greene's, you just brought up the most important, one of the, it, to me, especially in a philosophical sense, okay, um, a consciousness existing outside of the physical, right? Uh, 
And that's where science draws the line, right? Right there, there's a line in the set. We're not going there. You cannot have that conversation. But in Brian Greene's latest book, and he's a great physicist, and when, I think we all can respect Brian Greene. I do. But it, at the end of his latest book, which is called Until the End of Time, and it's a great book, and, and I've uh, suggested it to everybody. In the last chapter, now, he talks about the end of everything. When everything, matter comes apart, everything ceases to exist, everything dissolves. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. He says the last thing standing, right? The last thing after 100 trillion years, the last thing will be thought. Thought will continue to exist. He says thinking will continue. Now, wait a minute. Now, he won't say consciousness, right? <laughs> he, can't, he can't use that word. But he says thought will continue. Thinking will continue. These floating masses of thinking and thought will all be that uh, the last thing in the universe. Isn't that a strange... Is he trying to throw a softball? You know, it's almost like a peace pipe a peace offering without saying consciousness, but that's, that's what he's indicating, right? Yeah. I know his brother, Joshua Green, but, uh, uh, some, some thinkers and maybe him, I haven't read the book that you're speaking about, so I, I don't want to mischaracterize it, but, some researchers kind of say that there's some imprint left, uh, not consciousness, but uh, some imprint. Yeah, you know, when they say thinking, sometimes they mean like what a computer does in terms of carrying out some algorithm and. You know, some of them might be thinking like that, that there's something left over that can carry out those computational operations that we call thinking. But uh, Yeah, and, and that makes sense, except I don't think that's where Brian was going uh, there. I mean, I, I have gone back and I've read those pages a uh, hundred times. Just to confirm his thinking process, right? The way that he wrote it, I, I don't think there's another way to interpret it. And, and that's my take. But now let's go back. How do it, when we talk about Vamanas or we look at the ancient Sumerian texts and certainly uh, the texts out of ancient Egypt, and that also includes, you're right, uh, China. It, and then we ended up with with covered wagons all the way up till 1900, right? How did we go from that? Is that part of the de-evolution process? Yeah, well, I use the word de-evolution in a couple of senses. One is the, the sense that originally we're all beings of what I call pure consciousness. We're not from the world of matter. We're all extraterrestrials in that sense, that as individual conscious personal beings, we're not from the world of matter or from some higher level of reality. And the fact that we now find ourselves in a position where we're not on that level, we're in a level where we're covered by uh, mind and matter, that means we've devolved or come down. Now, modern science doesn't accept that. It, it has the idea that matter is the primary thing. And if you combine matter in a sufficiently complex way in the brain, then it develops consciousness. Uh, in other words, con as they would say, as conscious, intelligent beings, we evolve up from matter but when the matter becomes disorganized they would say there's no more consciousness uh, that i don't accept i accept that it's consciousness that's 
primary. And if anything, consciousness produces matter rather than the other way around. So that's yeah, yeah the, they want it to be a chemical process. Yeah, and uh, uh, about a week ago, last weekend, when they had the hurricane coming up into California, I was in Encinitas, California, at a conference on consciousness where they were discussing these things. And they were kind of pointing out that, you know, about 50 years ago, we thought by this time we'd have solved the whole problem of where consciousness comes from. But 50 years later, they're admitting, well, we're no closer than explaining how it comes out of neurons in the brain than we were 50 years ago. It would probably take us at least another 50 years, if at all. I don't think they'll ever get it. Well, if if if, if this is Ken, now look, I, I'm not a PhD. All right, I can't even. I play one on television though, but but I can't. I can't. Uh, but but I'm smart. Okay, so let's 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 back off on this. Let's back up a little bit here. If if consciousness is the way that science, the hard sciences, uh, prefers it, right? That it is a chemical process and it's particles combining together, and and the conscious uh, develops from that. Then this is the deal. They have built. You're going to Zurich, Switzerland. In mm -hmm. Zurich, they have the Brain Project there, where they have amassed this giant computer. It's huge, by the way. And their goal, and it's still an ongoing effort, was to repeat all of the neural connections in the brain in a computer. And that at once they get to these one trillion connections that that it it would start to mimic the human brain. When they got there, it didn't happen. So they're continuing the project, by the way. It's been going on for about 10 years. If it is what they say it is, then there is enough matter, right? There are enough particles in that giant computer that they've built, right? It's in this huge building. It's, you know, six stories tall, and it's 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 ginormous. That consciousness, that thing should be a sentient being by now, right? It should be as sentient as Martha Stewart. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it's not. not it, it, and, and what they have found is uh, the power of reason and, and everything, you know, laughter and humor and sadness and empathy and all of those things that come out of us is not happening with this computer. And yeah. our... It, 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 I, th I find that very interesting, and they haven't tapped out yet. They're still sticking to their guns. Well, here's here's an interesting thing. That, that whole project is based on the idea that consciousness is a product of some algorithm. You know, algorithm just tells the computer a series of steps to take to make some computation for some purpose. Um, but it seems that consciousness is not algorithmic because there are features of consciousness that can't be attained by running some algorithm, no matter how complex or fast the computer is, how much computing power it has. There are things that you can't calculate or compute with an algorithm and you one can. of them right, one of ahead. them is one of them is precognition in other words say if you uh, ask a computer well give me the number of a randomly chosen event yeah you know, that's going to take place three months in the future it can never figure that out but consciousness conscious people and this can be tested scientifically, have these precognitive 
experiences. So that's the one thing is, you took the to, you took the words out of my mouth. That's the one thing. Uh, well, there's many, but that's the that's the basic of all of this. You cannot program in life's experiences. Can't do it. Can't do it. Oh, oh it, 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 here's my example, and I would love yours. Right? I like. I'm just gonna just pull something out of the air. It's this simple. I like the color blue, and I want to go get a blue car. Now, a computer, you program that in, they're going to give me a list of really cool cars that come in the color blue, it, it thinks. But that's not why. Maybe it's when I was two, right? I, I saw something that was blue, and it smelled good to me, and I touched it, and I felt, and I have an emotional connection to the color blue, not because of blue cars, because of something else that I experienced. And it could go into a multi, you know, a, a many different reasons why, but you cannot do that with a computer. You can't program in. I, I'm 60 years old. I'm almost as old as you, or you might be a little older than me. Okay. So maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm 60, Michael. I've got 60 years of experience that allows me to make the, the, the decisions that I do, my likes and dislikes. You can't do that with a computer, can you? Well, here's, here's something I learned at this conference I went to in Encinitas. Uh, there are scientists, and one of them was present giving a lecture. She was present virtually. She's working on what's called artificial emotions. Uh, you know, some computers, they're dealing with artificial intelligence. Some researchers are dealing with that. And they're making some progress with it. But uh, she's looking at artificial emotions, you know, getting a, 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 some kind of system whereby computers can recognize emotion. And to me, it sounds very diabolic. You know, she was presenting it as something very positive. But if you had computers that are able to look at you, not just in terms of artificial intelligence, but in terms of your emotional state and use it to manipulate your choices, like which car to get, you know, by gathering clues about your emotional state and being able to recognize them, it's pretty, pretty frightening in one it's sense. It's way scary, man. That is way scary. Way scary. So I have a friend, a mutual friend of ours. I can't say who it is, but um, uh, I'll tell you off of the air. Okay. Um, oh, and, uh, and uh, oh, man, I almost slipped. You're going to be speaking at uh, Stairway to the Stars with us coming up in November. That's right. And there might be somebody in attendance there, and you can, uh, if, if, if he is there, I'm speaking in hypotheticals right now. I don't want to give anything away. But so he's got this, uh, he's got this, and I can't say anything because it's, I'm, I've, I've got an NDA going on. But let me just say this, the, the company called me, okay? Now, mm -hmm. and uh, so I get this text and the text comes in and says, hi, Jimmy, I'm so-and-so's uh, personal assistant and uh, I need to talk to you about something. Is it okay that I call? I said, yeah, sure. My phone rings, and I pick it up. Hello, Jimmy. Um, listen, uh, do you need some help with blah, 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 blah? And, and, and if you do, and I think that you do, I'll go ahead and uh, get it done for you. And I said, yeah, actually, I do. I'm really glad that you called. And the thing goes, yeah, so am I. I said, this is really cool. I said, what, what? Uh, Oh, holy crap, this is AI, right? <laughs> Michael, I bought it. Dude, I bought it. I bought it. I bought it. It took me about 30 seconds. And the only reason why that I knew 
is because I just, you know, NDA came into play. And But, yeah, man had me. Had me. I had no idea. I had no idea. The breathing, right, the pauses, the waiting for me to say something, the way that it interrupted me. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, but but let me just, I was like, oh, dude, it's getting good, Michael. And, and we're we're at the front of this. We're not even in the middle. We're at the very beginning, and it's getting pretty good. Yeah. In what the you, beginning, what? in the beginning, it seems like that, but we'll just have to see how it's used. Are, are you are you um, uh, at some point? Uh, will, will you consider this part of an evolutionary process? Is this something that we have to go through, or is this a de-evolutionary process? Well, you know, it depends. Like when the Internet first started, it, it was all very, very positive. But then, you know, other, other kinds of people began to use it for other purposes. So I think it all, all depends how things are used. They can be used for different purposes. So can you take me through your thought process on this? Um, what is, do we have a, a definitive evolutionary timeline? Um, you know, I accept evolution but not the kind that darwin and his modern followers talked about for me it's an evolution of consciousness not an evolution of physical embodiments i think the the embodiments are all there they don't evolve they're they're just available for us just like there are different kinds of cars we can buy they're all there different kinds of phones that we can get. Uh, you make your choice and you take it and live with what you've got. But uh, what evolves is the conscious self. And there may be an evolution whereby the conscious self, say, may begin in a plant or animal body and gradually lifetime after lifetime make progress through the different types of bodies until it comes to the human vehicle where we can understand what our situation is as conscious selves in the world of matter and either continue trying to dominate control and exploit the resources of matter and in competition with others who are trying to do the same thing. So I would say this technologies that we see developing, although they could be used to help people become more self-aware and conscious and not divide themselves up into competing groups and they could be used to help us satisfy our material needs in the most simple, natural, and efficient way and fair way possible while putting most of our energy into developing the resource of consciousness. Although it's possible it could be used for that, it's more likely going to be used in the realm of material competition among different groups for control of material resources. The <clears throat> Here's the problem that I have okay. with, with, with that. Um, we, these issues, I'll say it like Nick Pope, these issues, these issues that you've just put on the table where we are today has been written about and fought about and killed about since the beginning of time we've never been able to move past that and it seems like now where we're supposed to be pretty smart today um we've only had real science for 
technically, you know, 300,000 years, I, or three, 300 years, I would say, uh, uh, starting at Isaac Newton. That's my own thing. But we're, we're not any more smarter today than we were uh, 5,000 years ago when we started to discuss divisiveness. And, 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 and so this is the problem that I have. The last Kyle Caves. If you look at the, the dating that we have on those caves right now is 40, 45,000 years ago. And they were continuously occupied and painted in for 5,000 years, Michael, right? 5,000 years. And you look at the emotion and the depth and the artistic expression on those walls, I would argue that we had a firm grip on emotion and consciousness 50,000 years ago, and we haven't evolved at all. And, and clearly, uh, if, if you want evidence of that, it's right there on those cave, cave walls. Yeah, I, I think, well, that's a, another sense in which I use the word devolution. It means the, the covering of consciousness and its misuse you know, it, it kind of doesn't lead on an upward path. It's kind of like on a downward path. We're not making progress, as you say. Uh, but, you know, even if, uh, you know, sometimes when winter's coming on, you get a few good days, you know, Indian summer or something they call it sometimes. Or so sometimes, even though the progression is downward, you can go against the flow of the age. You know, that's always possible. Just because it's raining, it doesn't mean you have to get wet. Right. You know, you can <laughs> shelter yourself and shelter others. So maybe like that, you know. I think there have been times in history, if we look at the ancient wisdom traditions and the Vedic one in particular, there have been times when the dominant forces in society were arranged to facilitate uh, the elevation of consciousness. Now the whole worldwide civilization as it's been developed is not organized like that. It's based on other principles. So, and a, well, a lot of people... It. Uh, oh, man, I just did that twice. I am going to get a Vamana plasma bolt. I'm going to get struck no. down tonight, live on the air. But uh, I, I, You have to keep me from off my soapbox. <laughs> Your soapbox is so good, man. It's so good. The um, uh, the the ideas here, though, where and th this is where I just try to be as as frank as I can because I, I'm 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 in a general sense pretty pissed off. Okay, yeah. um, when we when we look at these ideas that are presented and the sciences today that have gotten more divisive than social media. Right. I mean, it, it, it's crazy. And some for some reason, I mentioned Isaac Newton earlier. Isaac Newton was a religious scholar. He was uh, and uh, he's a hermeticist. He was into yeah. all sorts of uh, uh, he was trying to figure out the, the philosopher's stone. He was a physicist. He was a mathematician. Right. He was a historian. He was all of those things. He thought about consciousness. He thought about the, he, he was all of those things. And then after that, you couldn't, right? They started to separate all of these things from uh, the sciences. And I think that we've lost our way because of that. Why can't we get science and, the, and, and consciousness and spirituality back together? Yeah, I... Yeah, I think the development you're talking about is a result of 
some deliberate choices that scientists made around that time, three or 400 years ago. What they decided they wanted to do was, because if you go back five or 600 years, even in Europe, you had people that were called scientists who were investigating alchemy, hermetic things, uh, we're talking about subtle energies and higher beings and witchcraft and mysticism and all of this stuff. Around three or 400 years ago, influential people in the world of science made a decision. Let's get rid of all that weird stuff and just focus on ordinary matter and let's try to understand it. And that was very productive for science in the sense that by doing that, by kind of setting aside the mystical, hermetic, and spiritual elements, they gained a lot of understanding of the gross physical elements, how to control them. And by that, they were able to develop technologies and those technological inventions that they made were very attractive to militaries, governments, corporations that could sell sell them. Uh, medicine, medicine was a big part of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. They, and what to speak of weapons, people really, governments really like that. And that's what got them investing in science, giving them millions of dollars, you know, and they, they liked it. And the general population liked the stuff that they produced and, you know, but it was at a cost. And the cost was they didn't have a complete picture of reality, you know, by ignoring consciousness, all these subtle things, they created a world with just incredible problems that they're never going to solve. And they set themselves up in such a way that there are a lot of questions they're never going to be able to answer. And if we don't have the right answers to those questions, we're going to make mistakes. And that's what we've got now. I think Newton was a good example of somebody who was able to balance spirituality, science, and philosophy. And I think that's what we're missing now, a proper balance between science, spirituality, and philosophy. You know, not all physicists are atheists, no. right? But, but in a general, if we're going to we're going to categorize something we could we can say that right there's yeah you know the the question of spirituality or consciousness or or any of that it's because first off you lose your fan base right if you're one of those rock star physicists or big thinkers out there then you are an atheist and if you if you in any way look like you're leaning out you, you know what i mean that you're about to drive out of your lane you just lose your fan base so they're just not going to do that and it also becomes a funding issue um as well and i and and i totally get that um but is, is there a way to to bring it back together that you can have a, the, the spirituality side of things answers so many questions that they can't get to, right? And it's because they say we can't measure it, ah, then I'm not going to waste my time. If I can't observe it, I'm not going to waste my time. And if I can't repeat this in the lab, I'm not going to waste my time. But yet they have all these gaps, right, in, in, in the scientific method that can get answered with, with consciousness and spirituality. Yeah. Well, there are some effects that can be measured by scientific instruments that are quantifiable. 
But um, the thing is, they just have, they're creating so many problems with their discoveries. And I mean, and I mean, there was this film, you know, about Robert Oppenheimer that came out recently. Uh, it touches on some very interesting issues, but uh, because science, it can develop things, but it, like it developed the atomic bomb during World War II. But the scientists that were involved in, in making that bomb, they, they wanted some voice over how it should or when it should or if it should be even used. And they uh, formed afterwards an organization called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist. It was formed by Robert Oppenheimer Einstein and some other physicists to kind of give a moral dimension to the whole thing. But they made something in 1947. They introduced what they call the doomsday clock, where they set it at uh, 20 minutes until midnight, midnight being nuclear catastrophe, the end of civilization, and all of that. And each year, they have adjusted the time and it's getting closer and closer to midnight so that this year, 2023, the uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists put the doomsday clock at 90 seconds from midnight, which is the closest it's ever been because after a long time, uh, we're starting to think about the possibility of nuclear war again. Yeah, in, in the 1980s, uh, yeah, there was a lot of concern about that. But you know, after uh, you know, the 90s or whatever, and the wall came down, people were thinking now everything's going to be fine. But it isn't. Uh, is that so. part? Uh, um, let, let me ask you this. Uh, be, we're going to take a break here for a few minutes and a couple of minutes. Um, the the idea behind that. Do you think that humanity in general is is growing up and maturing, and that that eventually we will work past it? I mean, nineteen sixty three, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I can't imagine the stress on the world, right? I, 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 I just can't. And and here we are, our stress levels are going up once again. Uh, is there, do, do you think that we're maturing as, a, as, as earthlings? Not as countries, forget about that. But I mean, in a general sense where we will get past this and the nuclear question will, will, will never go back to it. Well, I think there are parts of society, and I, I would put you in that category, who are becoming more mature and understanding things. But I think at the present moment, that's a minority of people. And is it, is it a demographic, though? Is it an age group? You know, if, if we go down, let's go down like three or four generations from you and I. Let's go down to the the kids today that are five, six, seven, eight, you know, to twenty years old. I don't think that they they. I think they are really about individuality and expression, and and the advancement of 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 all of those things. I just don't think that they're aware a, a warfaring. Uh, generation anymore. I just don't see it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I guess you have to look at the audience for your show. And I mean, well, if if you back up, okay. Like I said, you and I are the same age, right? Okay. So let's let's back up a little bit here. And if we go through the movements that happened in the '60s and the the awakening uh, that happened in in the 1970s and 
and and all of that. Carlos Castaneda, P- Pyramid Power, right? You remember those days? You remember that? Yeah. I bet I you know. were one of the first people to buy a waterbed. I'm sure you were. And so uh, that I think that was the beginning. But then that generation now is in Congress, right? <laughs> is in power over in the Soviet Union. It's like, wait a minute. Didn't you guys learn any lessons? It's, I find it very strange. Well, some of us are still out here. <laughs> right. Right. Where do we go? Why, you know, why aren't we? They, uh, uh, part, of, part of that generation, although they kind of participated in, you know, the flower power and summer of love and all of that, uh, when it kind of came down to it, they went back to uh you know they didn't make an alternative society you know they entered the uh, i don't know what you want to call it the borg or whatever <laughs> but <laughs> oh man uh, it, it, that is such an interesting way to to think about it and kind of put it into into context. Um, it seemed like uh, we were taking the turn, right? The age of Aquarius and 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 things were about to finally head into another direction. You know, make peace. Uh, you know, make love, not war. Uh, kind of thing. And it just seems like we've lost sight of that. I I did not think that we would. Uh, come as unglued as we did as quickly as we did over the last 15 or 20 years? Well, I do meet younger people who are part of the establishment institutions, maybe even scientists working at universities and different things like that. And many of them have become very interested in some of these things like out of body experiences and past life memories and things related to consciousness. And uh, they're able to somehow or other find each other and form little research groups that are investigating such things which are basically in terms of the dominant mainstream scientific paradigm, not very well accepted. So that's kind of interesting, an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, I, I should point that out too. It, that that. Is a, that's a really good take. And, and this is where, let's go back uh, to continuing this. Let's go back to the science and spirituality point that uh, you and I were discussing earlier. Today, physicists and quantum physicists are trying to convince us about something called entanglement. And now entanglement, which um, has been proven, right? I think it's now become science fact. Mm-hmm. It, uh, where before that was science fiction. And you could even go back to, you know, when I talk about entanglement, the ideas behind it, almost like the teleporter in, in, in Star Trek, for example, where we have a particle that can affect another particle on the other side of the universe in real time. You know, and that's where you go, well, wait a minute, but you, but you don't believe in spirituality, right? You don't believe in, in, in a telepathy, but you'll try to convince us that that is real. And then you go back to the slit experiment, which you're well aware of, where you can observe something and change its state. By by looking at it, Michael, right? By just yeah. looking at, by looking at it, but but you're not spiritual. You know, sp- spirituality doesn't and consciousness doesn't count. But entanglement, right? Schrodinger's cat is a real concept. It's well, like what? That may be a, a good way to proceed. You know, is uh, okay. Science is very committed to material explanations. But it turns out, in terms of quantum physics, that 
matter is very much stranger than they thought, you know? And I think those quantum features like entanglement and, uh, you know, the collapse of the wave function and everything like that, it's all very compatible with consciousness. And there were some physicists like uh, Niels Bohr and others uh, who had a role for conscious observation in quantum mechanics. You know, like you were saying, if, if it's when you observe something that it collapses from a state of quantum superposition where you have many uh, possible states of a physical system all simultaneously existing according to some probability distribution. And how does that turn into the one reality that we observe? It's by that role of consciousness and observing the system. It kind of collapses everything into one reality that we observe. So, uh, But isn't that, uh, but Michael, this is the problem. Aren't we discussing spirituality? Aren't we discussing uh, something else going on here than that that can be observed and measured? Yes. I, th this could be a step in that direction. Certainly. But uh, but you're you're right. You know, if you say quantum mechanics, it's mechanics. You know, it's not in itself spiritual. It's it's mechanics. So I think eventually you do have to come to the understanding that there's something beyond matter. Well, okay. So then I, I see three scenarios here. I see three. And so what would the world freak out on more? Okay. I mean, like lose, I, I was going to use a bad word. Let's just say lose their doo-doo. You yeah. use your own word. Okay. So three scenarios. Um, E.T. is visiting this planet. Uh, it, an ancient culture that existed on this planet a hundred million years ago, i.e. Atlantis, um, or three, there is another dimension here living among us. What, I mean, all three are possibilities and all yeah. three sciences is laying out the realities of this. Which would, which would freak everybody out more? Well, I think they're already freaked out by these things. Because right. the fact is that if you survey the general population, you find huge percentages of people accept these things. That's just a fact. And this is very upsetting to those who are trying to keep intact a more purely materialistic worldview. A, do a dogma of that materialistic yeah. worldview, I and might add. Yeah. Even though they completely control the education system and the scientific institutions, and they haven't been able to uh, get rid of these ideas among the general population. So it's kind of an unstable situation for them. It is. It is. It is. And and so, um, so this is this is my thing. UFOs were supposed to uh, cause chaos and anarchy, right? That was the original. You remember the Condon report and and what the Rand Corporation had said. Well, you know what? I think it's been accepted now that ET is here, and the Vatican is still here, and so is Wall Street. People are not jumping off of buildings. Um, and the second scenario, we're pushing back the timelines of Homo sapiens sapiens now by the day, right? They, it just keeps getting pushed back and pushed back. The next thing you know, 
um, that, and I think that Atlantis used to freak people out. I don't think it's that kind of party anymore. But this third part, this interdimensional, parallel world, multiverse, entangled scenario that quantum physics is now presenting to us, I don't know if uh, everybody's going to be able to accept that. Even the very idea of how a quantum computer works suggests that there are parallel worlds to the infinite to the left and right of us, right? That's I think that's a big pill to swallow for 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 everybody, and I think that's a that's a pretty good freak out. Yeah, that's. I think there was a scientist, a physicist named John Wheeler, who first proposed that multiple splitting. Yeah, I love John Wheeler. See, and you yeah. know what? Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Michael. We need more John Wheelers out there. We need more Feynmans. And where and, and Niels Bohr, as uptight as he was, and he was uptight, dude. He was uptight. Okay, he was not. He was not the nicest of guys. But even Niels Bohr thought outside of the box. And we don't have that today. Uh, we everybody just wants to just not buck the system. Why? Why is that? Wasn't science about thinking outside of the box and trying to find answers? Yeah. Well, I think there are a few exceptions. I was, I've been kind of very interested in the work of Avi Loeb. Yeah, Avi's great. Yeah. Yeah, what was he, head of the astronomy department at Harvard? He was, he was head of the black hole department. Yeah, absolutely. I've had dinner with Avi, okay? He was on yeah. my TV show last year, and, and I was able to hang out with him uh, for... I had a full night of dinner and conversation with him one on one. It was just just incredible. It and, seems you know, like a kind of an out of out of the box. You know what? I'm going to be straight with you. Yeah. He doesn't give a crap. He, he is just he is his own man. He does he doesn't care. He doesn't yeah. care. He's just going to do what he's going to do. Uh, but you're right about that. But he's the exception, not the rule. We need more Avi Loeb's for sure. Yeah. Um, let's take our break. Michael, stay right there. I'm, I'm 15 minutes late on the break, but the conversation is awesome. So I just blew past that. You stay right there. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Michael Cremo, talking about the de-evolution of us, that, and so much more, Forbidden Archaeology. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below, and we'll be right back. Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023, live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. As Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins, science, and technology expo. With live talks, lectures, and workshops by world-acclaimed researchers and authors, Featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. This is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with a special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit DisclosureFest.org. Hi, everybody. Jimmy Church here. Very special announcement, and that is we are shipping Fade to Black t-shirts again. It's been almost two years. We did a full upgrade to the website, so you can head over to JimmyChurchRadio.com. It's all simple to do, and it's right there. Remember... We broadcast four nights a week, Monday through Thursday. We bring you the best, the brightest, the most knowledgeable and amazing guests, the best conversations. We do that four nights a week. We also do four days a week. We broadcast the news, and we do that live, too, as well. I, it's not a one-man show. 
I do it with website support. I do it with producers. I do it with writers and artists. All contribute to the show. The best way to help support what we do here is with the Fade to Black t-shirt. And you can get your Fade to Black t-shirt one of two ways. First, Go to jimmychurchradio.com, order a shirt. It's really that simple. You're going to get a tracking number, it's going to get shipped, and it's going to get autographed. The second way to get a shirt is with a Game Changer membership. Now, the Game Changer membership not only includes a free t-shirt, but you get a private email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads. You have full access to the website, and everything includes includes free shipping and everything is autographed. So help support the show. Get your fade to black t-shirt today. The links are below. You can just go to jimmychurchradio.com and it's right on the website. So there you go. I'm Jimmy Church, fade to black. I'm so excited that I just have one thing to say. Go back Lee Tappy. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. Uh, I hit the mute button. So so everything that I just said, which was incredible, um, only I heard it. Um, head over to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and check out Billy Carson's stuff over there because it's exactly what uh, we're covering tonight. Michael Cremo has been at this for decades. And so if you're interested in this subject, head over to ForbiddenKnowledge.com, uh, ForbiddenKnowledge.tv, and check out all of the great programming we have over there. And all of Michael's links are below. And so uh, with that, Michael, um, I have to... Uh, can I ask you just a direct question? Like, I sure. mean, direct, I mean, direct. I'm just going to go, I'm going to go straight there. Yeah. You, um, you have uh, been writing about this and speaking about all of these subjects. Uh, you call, you know, you're the, you're the, you're called the forbidden archaeologist for a reason. Um, and uh, what, what happened there was something in your life, man. There was something that happened that just, you know, and uh, were you always this way? Or was there a specific event that put you on this hero's journey? Well, in, in one sense, I've always been this way in the sense that even from a very young age, from being a child, I was always interested in the truth yeah, is what I'm being told, is it factual? Is it fair? I, I never liked uh, being treated unfairly or seeing others treated unfairly. So you could say I've always had an interest in those things. I think one thing that really influenced me you know, growing up was the fact that uh, I'm from a military family. My father was a, an Air Force intelligence officer. 
And yeah, that meant a few things for me as I was growing up. One of them was I was traveling to a lot of different places in the United States and Hawaii and different countries and different parts of the world. I lived for three years in Germany when I was in high school. And I was exposed to a, a lot of people in the intelligence services. So that meant a few things. One thing it meant is I was aware that there's a lot going on in the world that people just don't know about because it's, quote, classified. Uh, so that, that had an influence on me. And the fact that I got exposed to a, a lot of different cultures had an influence. And among the cultures that I was exposed to, one was the Vedic culture of ancient India. So that got me looking into things like uh, human history. The Vedic histories, which are called the Puranas, told of human populations existing on earth millions and millions of years ago. So I had to think, is that just some mythological idea? Or is there perhaps some factual basis for it? And that's what got me looking into the history of archaeology. You know, if you look in the current textbooks, you don't see any evidence for what I call extreme human antiquity, humans like us existing in the very, very distant past. But because of my involvement with people in, in intelligence, I realized, well, what, what I see in the textbooks may not be the whole story. So, so that's what got me looking into the original scientific reports uh, from the time of Darwin all the way to the present. And when I looked at those original reports, I found accounts of many archaeologists, geologists, other scientists digging into the earth who uh, were discovering and reporting in the professional scientific literature human bones, human artifacts, human footprints going back very far in time. So I collected all those reports and put them in the book Forbidden Archaeology. So that's in a very brief way, how I got involved on this particular quest. There was, um, uh, uh, this is, okay. This is, this is where I'm at with all of that today. And my methodology, um, a lot of it, I'm just gonna put onto you. I mean, you have allowed me to think outside of the box. And and you presented stuff in in such a way. I mean, I've had I've had forbidden archaeology. Uh, I've had a few different versions of the book, but I have the original my original copy that that I've had for a very long time. And this is why I am tripping so much today because, and I'm just talking about like recent stuff. Right now, there is talk inside of the scientific uh, community, the science community, uh, astrophysicists and astronomers, that the Big Bang may not have happened. Now, that, that's going to tip things over if, if they continue. And the launch of the James Webb uh, Space Telescope is finding old galaxies that shouldn't have developed. They didn't have the time. This is where, you know, Darwin's always been wrong, but now really we're going to be able to push this off the table completely. In that, this report was uh, published last Wednesday. I reported on it today. Um, out of the University of Calgary, they're now dating the universe at 26.7 billion years. Right now, the general accepted date is 13.8 billion years. Um, science is always a series of corrections, right? But if this comes out um, and it, it, where 
the dating of the Big Bang, it, 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 it's, it's possible that it just may not, not have happened. And maybe we've just been around uh, forever. That's a pretty interesting turn of events, don't you think? Yeah. Well, for me, I've always kind of thought that I think the evidence for a human presence, on, at least on this planet, goes back so far in time that we you know, would have to think that it's pretty close to the beginning. And I would say uh, it's like if we make a space station, you, know, you have a space station, you send it into outer space, we don't just hope that somehow or other the gases in the space station will combine together automatically and form some first single-celled creature, which will then evolve into astronauts capable of using the machine. Yeah, we make a universe, or God makes a universe, or somehow the universe comes into existence. It's got a purpose, and that purpose is fulfilled in the human form of life, so the human form of life has been around since the beginning. I would say it's pretty obvious to me but uh, well and and is it okay so let me i'm gonna back up i'm gonna back up that statement of yours all okay. right i'm gonna back it up right now and this is i'm gonna back it up with science fact okay okay right now and it's going to happen again for the second time uh this year we're going to get the samples from the asteroid Bennu. Right? They're going to come back to Earth, and we're going to take a look at it. Now, when that happens, um, this will be the second time where we have gone out to an asteroid, sampled its contents, and found out that they contain RNA. Right? It's like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You mean that the basic sugars, the building blocks of life that make up RNA which is just as important as DNA. That's the transference of information, right? That's the instruction set for DNA is truly universal. It's floating around out there in the vacuum of space, Michael, and surviving. And you remember the ideas of panspermia originally? Sure. Well, it turns out, I mean, this is science fact now. So I would say that that supports exactly what you just said. That RNA and DNA, uh, us, the, the, the basics of us are throughout the universe. And I don't think there's another way to accept it. Yeah. Uh, I, that scientist who's in charge of that project, the project uh, whereby they sent a probe out to that asteroid to gather some some uh, samples and bring them back to Earth. It's going to be happening very quickly if it hasn't happened yet. It's, uh, it's, I think it's September. Oh, wait. We're not. I think it's September 23rd is the splashdown. Yeah, he was actually at this conference I was at in Southern California. And he was explaining how they're going to have those samples very, very soon. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Basically what I've seen since you know I published Forbidden Archaeology is that they've been pushing the timeline for a human presence on this planet further and further back in time. They're taking little steps. Uh yeah, you know, when I was writing uh, Forbidden Archaeology, they were thinking humans had been around about 100,000 years. And then 10 years later, they were thinking about 200,000 years. And now they're up to about 300,000 years. So it's like they're taking baby steps in the right direction. But they still got a long way to go as far as I'm concerned. What, why do you, um, uh, if we if we look at, okay, so let's just say the Earth is four and a half billion years old. Our sun is four and a half billion years old. Okay, so we've got these, these basic timelines here. Uh, 
But the timelines of Darwin's explanation of the evolutionary process, honestly, seriously, they don't match up with the timelines. They, they just don't. And after every uh, mass extinction event that we've ever had on this planet, and we've had what we think around five, maybe six, maybe seven, um, right after that, everything just just came back and 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 grew. There wasn't any time for that evolutionary process that that Darwin talks about. Why do you think that is? Well, I think the real situation is that yes, periodic catastrophes that wipe out much of life on Earth do occur. And it's interesting, the uh, Vedic texts speak of uh, different cycles of creation and destruction. And within those cycles, there are other cycles. So one cycle is called the Kalpa or the day of Brahma. And according to that, the earth uh, was first manifested a couple of billion years ago. And since that time, it said there have been six devastations, which in my mind correspond to the, as you were putting it, five or six major extinction events that have occurred on Earth. But according to the Vedic cosmology, uh, there's kind of like cloud computing. In other words, at some higher level, all the resources for rebooting life on this planet exist. Like, you know, if you have uh, all your programs, songs, uh, videos, and stuff on in the cloud, so to speak, then even if your device gets destroyed, you know, then you can when you get another device, you can download everything from the cloud and kind of restore, restore it. it. Yeah, restore it. Right, right. So without taking all the time to regenerate all of them, it's, you just download them and, you know, you've got it. Oh, so, that's interesting. So I think something like that occurs in the history of life on Earth that, yeah, there are these periodic catastrophes that take place, wipe out a lot of the species, but they can be replaced. Like a Not, giant seed bank. Yeah. Right? Like fairy dust gets scattered around. Yeah. Right? You know, something like that. That's interesting. Yeah. Thinking out of the box. You know, no, no, that's Johnny Appleseed, but on a cosmic scale. Yeah. Right, right? Now, look, I'll be here all week. Try the veal. Okay, try the veal. I'll be here all week, Michael. But, yeah, but that's a really, really good point. And wouldn't, um, let's say, would you be surprised if that turned out to be the case? You know, we jumped 10,000 years further, you know, we look back. In, in history, and I think that you would be on the right side of history with that kind of statement. I, I, I don't think it's that far-fetched. Well, it's basically information that I've gotten from the Vedic text. It seems to match up in a lot of ways. The periodic catastrophes do take place. They are roughly the same number. You know, like six devastation events, six uh, extinction events, according to the Darwinists. But uh, the resources for repopulating the Earth are always there. So things can be restored. It's just, yeah, because it just happens too quickly. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about tens and tens of thousands of of species that just, you know, they're back just like that. And that it's not only animals, but it's plants, too, as well, and insects and everything just happen yeah. to appear overnight. 
Um, well, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, I don't want to let this thought escape me. Okay. Um, I was watching, this is about six months ago, and I thought about you. And uh, I've seen this documentary, and, and you probably know the documentary, one, and two, the place that I'm talking about. But I see this Vedic library, right? And it's stacks and stacks. Uh, each book is yay thick, you know, big long. Uh, each one containing thousands of pages. All of those stacked up. There are thousands of books and manuscripts, thousands upon thousands, that have not been read since they were written. Right? That's it. Right, they're going through and transcribing and translating these texts. It seems like it's going to take thousands of years. Um, uh, what, what do you make of that? And and how much information is there? And shouldn't we shouldn't we get technology involved with this? Shouldn't we be translating this and transcribing this in mass now? Uh, yeah, I'm aware of projects that are attempting to do just that. Uh, you mentioned books. These uh, manuscripts are usually written on maybe you know, some kind of plant leaf or something, and they're kind of engraved, and, uh, the, and then some ink is uh, spread over the engravings of the letters and it's like and then they put thousands of these leaf manuscripts together I think that's what you're talking about yes 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 and um, I've been to several projects that are engaged in exactly what you said they are uh, first of all, just preserving these things because they will get destroyed. You know, it's, uh, they don't last, you know, very long, you know, because they're, they're, they're made of plant material, most of them. And, you know, they'll decay eventually unless, I mean, the, the way it used to work is if somebody wanted the book, they would copy it. You know, they would make a copy of it, make their own copy. It might take them a, a few weeks to do it all. And then they would leave the new copy in the, the repository, whether it was some temple or some library, and they take the old one with them. That way they keep renewing it. But uh, and then that way they've been able to transmit knowledge from very ancient times all the way up to the present. But now the chain is sort of broken down and nobody's hand copying manuscripts anymore. So there's some necessity to preserve them digitally. And as you say, then translate them. Is, so it, could AI... Could AI assist in this and get it done faster? Um, I would guess they're already employing that. I, right. I haven't visited the particular institutes that I'm talking about you know, very recently, but I, I can inquire how they're, they're doing it. But yeah, I'm... I'm sure they'll make use of whatever resources are there. There's so much. There's so much of it. it it's intimidating to see and just to think when you see these pages, right, just full, you know, one page. And what would be involved in it? In, in, <laughs> you haven't even gotten to the second page yet. And it just looks like if you use the human mind, Right, and the human side of it, it, it seems like it would take generations to get through all of that. And there's got to be some automated process to come in and, and save these and, and get it translated. First off, there's a lot to learn from it, right? Second, it, it, it could just go away. And you're right, the plant material uh, could break down and, 
And the next thing you know, we, you know, and it's, we're going to be in a coulda, woulda, shit up. We should have done it. We should have done it. At least take pictures. And, and, and they didn't do it. Is, um, is, is the country of India and their traditions, is, is it the oldest continuous, right? The oldest continuous, uh, culture and, and religion in the world? Uh, it's one thing that really attracted me to the Vedic system because, like I say, some people are kind of into the Sumerian text and some people are into the Egyptian text. And there aren't really, I mean, maybe there are some secret societies, you know, but just in terms of what people are able to experience generally, there aren't any representatives of that culture, you know, the, the culture of the people that made the pyramids or whatever. As I said, there may be some secret societies where this has kind of survived underground, but in terms of what's visible today to the ordinary person, the culture that produced those things is gone. Same with the Sumerian text. Yeah, you know, there's a different culture there today. Uh, but the Vedic text, there's still a surviving population of people that live according to those teachings. And that's what I found kind of interesting. It's not like a dead tradition. It's a kind of a living tradition that's persisted. I mean, despite the fact that there have been, I mean, the British took over the country for a while and others, yeah, but it's kind of survived up to the present day. And I have found that very interesting. When I, um, uh, I'm actually going to turn this towards ET a little bit because you, you mentioned this at the very front of the show. But when you go uh, to these uh, different megalithic sites, although I haven't been to Gobekli Tepe yet, but that's 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 coming up, and I'm finally go going to be able to get there, which pushes back the timeline, uh, the dogma, I should say, another 7,000 years, maybe 8,000 years, maybe even older than that, which is a pretty crazy thought that uh, you... And I, in our community, have something like Gobekli Tepe to piss the man off, right? Because it wasn't, it quite simply wasn't supposed to exist. And I think that there's a lot of Gobekli Tepes out there uh, around the world that will continue to push back the timeline, just like your book did. Um, but when you go to uh, Egypt and you look at the sizes of things and the, the amount Right, the size, but it's also the amount because it's everywhere that you look when you go to Dashur or you go to Saqqara or even head down uh, or up the Nile, I should say, to Karnak or Edfu. And, and you look at these things, um, these temples are everywhere. It the population of Egypt, Michael, couldn't support the building of all of this stuff, they didn't have they, they, there wasn't a population there. Um, it, it, it just it, it doesn't make any sense. So there must have been an easy way to get this stuff done. I'm not suggesting aliens built it, but the technology behind it had to have been taught and come from somewhere else. Do you agree with that statement? Um, yeah. Uh, in principle, I mean, demonstrating where it was, what the source was, would be... The trick, I guess. But sometimes the Egyptians say that their culture came from the East. You know, so there may have been some contact with other cultures with resources. What do you think? I'm looking at the clock here before we run out of time. Uh, you know, suggesting the A word here, Atlantis, right, or or 
or something similar to that. That's exactly what academia doesn't want us to do. But when you go into the deep uh, ancient text of, of Egypt and other cultures around the world, it's not just the Egyptians, but do talk about the survivors of something catastrophic that were the foundations of their culture and society. And it, without using the A word, um, is this, uh, you know, the lone survivors of a highly technical advanced uh, civilization that goes back hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of years? Um, I think that's quite possible. Uh, like, I'm not a, an Atlantis researcher in particular, but the general Neither principle. Am I. But the general principle that in the past there was some worldwide civilization that was very advanced is something that I'm prepared to accept. The Vedic texts speak of that. You know, they say that in very, very ancient times, uh, there was an emperor, an empire that extended its influence over the entire planet. So, yeah. Well, why, uh, why, okay, when science wants to say it's about the facts, right? Well, uh, we start to examine the fossil record, which you presented very elegantly. And we look at the fossil record or something like Gobekli Tepe suddenly appears. And that, that and that's not enough to, to stir the discussion. And they, they just want to ignore. The fossil record is the one thing that they're supposed to depend on. But uh, even with your evidence and the stuff that is out there, it's it's not enough. Uh, I, I, I just don't get it. Why is it that they just want to continue to put up the fight? Well, I think it has to do with uh, power for one thing. Uh, people who have power don't like to give it up, especially if they have monopoly power. So, like if a political party has a monopoly on the political life of a country, it you know, doesn't want to give up its position. Or a certain corporation may have a monopoly in a certain sector of the economy, doesn't want to give up its position. So, I think there are different kinds of power in the world. There's military power, there's political power, there's also intellectual power. It's a very subtle power, but a very real one. And what the people who possess this power have the ability to do is define our identity. You know, to say, you're a purely material being. And they do this through their monopoly in the education system in most countries around the world. It's a government-enforced monopoly. And what they try to define us as is you're purely material beings in competition with each other for survival. And basically, uh, your purpose, I mean, not that this is necessarily dictated. When people accept this, they think it themselves that my purpose in life is to produce and consume more and more material things. And you get a whole set of political, social, educational, uh, financial, uh, and even religious institutions that are based on that, that people remain in their little box defined by their sense of identity and produce and consume more and more material things, which generates wealth, which flows into certain pockets and not in that of others. 
So you get this whole web of institutions, as I said, political, economic, financial, military, uh, religious even, that are based on that. And the alternative is, you know, if you challenge any fundamental aspect of what goes into building that picture of reality, whether it's archaeology or physics or astrophysics, if you challenge any of the existing ideas which are based on that idea that everything's coming from matter, you know, or, you know, your values, your goals and objectives become very materialistic. Now, if any part of the, the scientific evidence that is used to support people having that sense of identity and those kinds of values is challenged, then they resist it. You know, it's like if you had a different sense of identity, we're all beings of pure consciousness. I'm a being of pure consciousness. You're a being of pure consciousness. We don't have to divide ourselves up into all these competing groups. We can work together to satisfy our material needs in a very simple, natural way. Uh, yeah, there would be less economic activity of the type that's going on now. And all of those institutions would just fall apart. Yeah, you know, there'd be a different set of institutions. So I think that in one way or another, this power to dictate to people their sense of identity and thus influence their values, goals, and objectives which become very materialistic and become enlisted in uh, these institutions, then, you know, they, they don't want to see that. Well, if, 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 if this is how, this is why we're like a walking contradiction. We picture, and we do this in in science fiction, we do this with our imagination. But yeah. if we were to finally, you know, make contact with uh, an ETC, an extraterrestrial uh, civilization that is here, I don't think, why would we expect them to have a monetary-based capitalistic view of life? We wouldn't. I don't know what they would be doing, but it certainly wouldn't be, you know, in a class system, you know, in us or them, you know, no. And how, how would we get to that? Now, I'm not suggesting a communist way of life. I'm not. And you can look behind me and see these guitars. You know, I what? was looking I, at them. Yeah, I'm a pretty materialistic guy, and I'm not giving that up for for Earthlings and ET contact. But that's not what I'm suggesting. But but we have this this hypocritical view of 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 things where we've got to straighten stuff out here. We need to become Earthlings, and and I don't know how. You know what I mean? How do we get rid of boundaries? How do we get rid of borders? I, I just I I don't know. I don't know how we achieve that. I don't know how we get to the next level. I don't. And here's the other strange part. Okay. Let's say some catastrophic event hit us, right? Nuclear war, an asteroid, you know, maybe some infectious disease, whatever, whatever. But we stop or whatever re alien invasion. I don't know. But we stop. And two or three, four, five million years from now, there is going to be a radio host interviewing another forbidden archaeologist, right? And that society 10 million years from now is going to be into, there was nothing before us, right? We're the ridge, <laughs> right? There was nothing before us. What yeah. are you talking about? And I could see history repeating itself. 
And who's to say that this hasn't happened multiple times in the deep past? As he grins, as as he grins, I I got it. That was number three tonight, Michael. Okay. Right? Am I wrong? I'm not wrong, am I? No, I I think that's exactly what's happened. Like you were saying, we have amnesia. And I, 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 you brought up this interesting point earlier. Here's the crazy thing. If we look at Cleopatra, right? Cleopatra. He is a closer relation to Michael Cremo than she was with Narmer. Mene, right? The first pharaoh. Mm. By, by a thousand years. By a thousand years. And by the time Cleopatra was struggling to speak ancient Egyptian to write and write that even by that point when she was around all of the traditions had already been forgotten that that that's a crazy thought and that and we're talking about Cleopatra and as soon as she was gone right Rome and everything else that happened to Egypt everything virtually overnight was forgotten Nobody spoke Egyptian. Nobody read uh, or wrote uh, hieroglyphs, uh, any ancient language, any ancient text, any of the ancient traditions. All of that was completely forgotten. And, you know, a couple of hundred years later, if somebody went to Egypt and they were like, what are those? I don't know. Oh, okay. They, They look cool. Talking about the pyramids, right? They were just sitting there collecting dust in the desert. Nobody knew anything about them. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. A lot happens in 2,000 years, which really isn't that much. Nope. Because Cleopatra, I think, was maybe it's a little more than 2,000, maybe 2,100 years or something like that, but not that long ago. No, it's crazy. It's it's just a crazy thought that she is uh, closer to us than she was with Mene. I mean, that's crazy. That was 3,000 years, and we're sitting at 2,000 years. I just, it's its a mind-blowing situation. And when somebody goes, well, how can we have amnesia? You know, does it give me evidence of this actually happen, happening? And look at Sumer. Look at Mesopotamia. Look at Gobekli Tepe, for that matter. Nobody knows anything about that. Anything. We don't know anything. We have no idea. We don't. It was, and, and it, the, here's the other part about Gobekli Tepe. They buried it. They, intent, right. yeah, they intentionally buried it and never came back. Wow. Yeah, just crazy. Thousands, thousands of years ago, they buried it. They buried it at 8,000 BC. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 10,000 years ago. Well, uh, Michael, thank you so much. What are you going to be speaking about at uh, Stairway to the Stars? Uh, I'm speaking about an aspect of uh, forbidden archaeology. I I call it the Silurian hypothesis, which uh, I'll be talking about. I'll explain what that is there. And it's quite interesting. And in that context, I'll be giving some very striking examples of evidence for extreme human antiquity going back very far in time. So that's something to look forward to. I'm really looking forward to that event. There's a lot of really interesting people, researchers, and you've got so many interesting uh, side events going on, like the uh, Star Watch. Oh, yeah. We're going to Area 51. Are you going to come with me? You can ride on my bus. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're taking four buses out there. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be a good time. I'm really looking forward to that. They haven't had that kind of action in a long time. Four buses rolling in, a bunch of guys getting off like you and I. <laughs> Just, I cannot wait for that. Michael, uh, all the best. And, and thank you to Lori, of course. Um, she is just a, a great go-between. Uh, the yeah. two of us. She's absolutely amazing. And we'll see you November 10th, 11th, and 12th at Stairway to the Stars. Thank you so much, Michael. Behave and be well, and don't stop your mission, man. Okay. 
I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Okay, Jimmy. You're the best. Michael Cremo. And I've got all of Michael's links below, by the way. Uh, 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 MCCremo.com, MyScienceMyReligion.com, ForbiddenArchaeologist.com, HumanDevolution.com, and, of course, ForbiddenArchaeology.com. All of the links are below. We have them there over on our website and throughout social media. I want to remind everybody, uh, tomorrow night, right here on Fade to Black, Michael. Avon Oming is going to be with us. Got a lot to talk about. It's always great when Michael is here. And I will show and announce the new Fade to Black t-shirts. All of that is tomorrow night. Uh, All that and much more tomorrow night with Michael Avon Oming. And, oh, wait, wait, there's my fader. That's called a fader, you fader knots. All right, great show tonight. Thank you, Michael. Perfect, perfect conversation and a fade to black is produced by Hilton J Palm, Renee Newman and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin. Webmaster is drew the geek music, Doug Aldrich intro space boy, space boy music.com. Fade to black is produced by KJC over the game changer network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by fade to black and the game changer network Inc. It cannot be, Copy, downloaded, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Michael Oming, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.